For Cremo Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimudli. Joining me today is Lily Leaves Farm CEO, Nicholas Swolpe, here to discuss the future of the farm and the current political climate in South Africa. Now, Lily's Leaf is a heritage site, but for those who are not familiar with it, can you give us a brief history of the farm? In order to give a brief history, I th one has to start with in a, giving the political context. It emerged out of political consequences, events, that were shaping and defining how the liberation struggle was evolving, how the liberation movement was evolving. So one has to start really in the 50s, which was a defining period in our liberation struggle. Up until the 50s, the ANC was what I like to refer to as a gentleman's club, the leadership sitting around, drinking and discussing. It wasn't a mass organization. It wasn't mobilizing the people. They were submitting letters, petitions. They were hoping that the British government had a moral conscience, that the British government would respond to their demands, would take notice of their demands and put pressure, you know, in the early period. 1950, the Communist Party with the Indian Congress hold a strike. 18 people are killed, which is the start the next phase is the defiance campaign, where you start to really see mass mobilization take effect. You then have the Congress of the People in 1955, which drafts the Freedom Charter, resulting in the treason trial because the apartheid government saw it as sedition, as treason, that this document had as its motive, its intention to overthrow the estate, to replace it with a new government. They saw it as sedition. Sharpville was a manifestation of the changes that were taking place. Towards the end of the 50s, the ANC started talking about a past burning campaign. The PAC stole a march on them and organized a past burning campaign. And they gathered outside the police station in Sharpville where 69 innocent people, mainly women and children, were shot in the back. And that sent revulsion around the world. It, for the first time, I would believe the international community took note of the, the system of apartheid. But not only the system of apartheid, but the brutality with which the apartheid state was willing to go to, to repress and to snuff out any opposition. But Sharpville event was a defining moment also because the ANC Youth League, who had been formed in the late 40s under the leadership of people like Gavin and Becky, Oliver Tambo, uh, Nelson Mandela, Walter Susulu, had been agitating for the ANC to move away from solely passive resistance because they felt that it wasn't achieving the aims and objectives. Where had it got the ANC? Where had it got them in terms of achieving a non-racial, non-sexist, free democratic society? There were no tangible results. So they believed that a more draconian response needed to be given. And so there was this debate throughout the 50s about moving away slowly from passive resistance to a combination of passive resistance and armed struggle. Sharpville propelled and pushed the ANC and its leadership over the cliff, so to speak. It was its Rubicon. That Rubicon was enough. And that famous interview that Nelson Mandela gave in 1961 to um, Brian Woodlake, in which he says, we cannot allow the killing of an armed and defenseless people to give you to. There comes a time where we must take action. That was the signal that they were moving to armed struggle. The consequences of Sharpeville led to the ANC and other political formations being banned. So in 1950, the Communist Party were banned, and in 1960, the um, ANC, PAC, and other formations were banned. And interestingly, they said, you know, that was a really naive move on the part of the apartheid government, because it then gave them no one to negotiate with, because every organization had been declared illegal, and every member and leader of those organizations had been banned. Simultaneously, within that banning, it became increasingly difficult for the Communist Party to meet at these safe houses because now these safe houses were being filled by those that had been forced to operate and go underground. 
So, Bram Fischer, the chairman of the Communist Party, instructed Michael Harmel and Ahmed Kathar to go out and find a place where they could meet. Michael Harmel, we believe, discovered Lily's Thief, and it was purchased under the pretext that they had a sick relative who was recovering and who needed a secluded and quiet place in which to recover. So that's the context in which Lily's Thief came into being. So the purchase of Lily's Thief coincided with the move away from solely passive resistance to armed struggle. It was purchased in August of 1961 through a front company called Navi and PTY Limited for the Communist Party. So it was purchased as the headquarters of the Politburo, the Secretariat and the Central Committee of the Communist Party. It was a secret headquarters. And they made this available to the ANC and initially MK. And they needed, if they wanted to bring anyone here, they needed permission from the Secretariat. But as Ahmed Kathadra describes it, through a process of osmosis, Lily's Leaf became the high command of the newly formed military wing on Kuntua Seasway. It became the hub of the military wing. It was from here that they met, discussed and planned the overthrow and military operations. Its first occupant was Nelson Mandela, who moved on in October of 61, posing as the gardener in the blue overalls, waiting for his master to move on which was the Goldreich family who fronted as the white owners, and we call them the white facade, to create that Im impression of acceptability. So Lily's Leaf gradually became the hub of the liberation movement. I call it the inverted diaspora of the liberation movement. It wasn't just the headquarters of the Communist Party, the High Command, it became the meeting place of the various other bodies around that were linked to it of the Congress Alliance. Nelson, on his last visit, said what made Lily's Leaf unique. It was unique because it was a place of intellectual, ideological, strategic, military discourse and engagement. And it was the notion of discourse engagement. This was a place of discourse engagement. This was a place of discussion and debate. And the raid on the 11th of July, 1963, in itself, was a very defining feature. Why? First and foremost, the raid captured most of the leadership. They stumbled across most of the leadership when they raided. It effectively was a hammer blow and the destruction of the internal liberation movement. It still existed, but it was limping along. And the Little Ravonia trial, which followed the Ravonia trial and the Brown Fisher trial, destroyed whatever semblance of hope of reconstituting the internal liberation leadership. It crushed it. It had already been crushed, but it was, as I said, limping along. The raid led to the Ravonia trial. Nelson, who had been arrested a year earlier, in 62, was brought as accused number one because they found his diary and his papers in the coal shed. The evidence that was presented at the Ravonia trial was found here and at James Cantor's law firm. They discovered Operation Maibu. So the raid on Lily's Leaf led to the Ravonia trial, which led to subsequent life imprisonment for eight of the ten accused and the internal destruction. And some would say that the positive consequence of the raid on Lily's Leaf and the setback ultimately had a positive impact in that it led to 1994. Your parents were also significantly involved in the struggle. Can you tell us a bit about their role and about how much you remember about it? Well, I'm going to start with 2001 when I put on the Rivonia ring because on the day of the event someone came up to me and said, are you aware of something? And I said, what shall I be aware of? And he said, I can't believe you're not aware of this, but 40 years ago your father did the legal purchase to buy Lily's Leaf in 1961. He did the legal transaction. He was the lawyer that did the legal transaction and he said 40 years later you are beginning to buy back properties which made up what was originally Lily's Leaf, the 28 acre farm which was in the peri-urban area of Rivonia. But he also met here as head of military intelligence. So he was head of military intelligence, which met here. So my mother tells a, a wonderful story about how my grandmother used to ask her, where is Harold? And she would say, oh, he's out playing poker. But in fact, he was here at Lily's Leaf. Um, so poker was the cover. And when they raided Lily's Leaf on the 11th of July, 
it was only going to be a matter of time that they were able to link my father to Lily's Leaf because there was a document here in his handwriting which was the code of conduct into guerrilla warfare. So even they wrote a code of conduct, how to conduct guerrilla warfare. I mean, that goes to the extent, and they made it quite clear that they were not going to attack people, they were going to attack instruments of the apartheid state, symbols of the apartheid state, not people. So the day after the raid, Molly Fisher, Bram Fisher's wife, came to my parents' house and told my father a raid and warned him that he must get out before they arrested him. So he went up to Rustenburg and the idea was he went to stay at cousins of my mother's and that he was then going to go for a picnic with one of the cousins and two Norwegian guests and wander across the border. But what actually happened, the cousin claimed that he was lost and decided that he must go and ask at this, little, this farm where the, they were supposed, where the place they were heading to was. Just so happened that at the time that they went to the farm there was a whole group of policemen so you can draw your own conclusions from that. He was arrested or detained, taken to Pretoria Central, from Pretoria Central to Marshall Square where he, along with three other comrades, broke out of prison. So he would have been one of the Ravonia trialists but broke out of prison and they effectively inflicted the ills on the brother-in-law. So he was a partner in my uncle's law firm and they charged him with sabotage for two reasons. One, because he fed the chickens here at Lily's Leaf and the second, we believe, because they inflicted the ills on the brother-in-law. So the, there is that very strong connection. And I remember as a little boy looking through my uncle's book, he wrote a book called A Healthy Grave and there's this iconic picture of the main house. And I used to look at it wondering what this place was, wondering why this place was so unique, wondering why Lily's Leaf was so central and so critical to the liberation struggle. So that's the connection and of course my father continued and as the project has unfolded I've started to learn a lot more about my father and I've even told my mother and she had no idea. I'd like to tell you and it's a very poignant story because to some degree it goes to the, it highlights the antithesis of where the ANC is today. It highlights the disgrace of what the leadership of the ANC under Jacob Zuma has done. It reveals how far the moral perpetuity and fiber of this wonderful, great organization, it has strayed from that. So we were doing a store, we were capturing the memories and testimonies of MK operatives. And one day I came back to Lily Seif and it was at the beginning of December. I think it was 2015. And I got out of my car and I saw the group and I started to head over to them. And as I was walking over to them, five of them stood to attention. And I said, what are you doing? They said, we salute the son of our commanding officer. And I nearly burst into tears. And when I tell the story, I want to cry. Because it was so poignant, the respect that they showed and these were people who had nothing and you think these people gave up everything not for any return not in expectation of any form of gratification self-enrichment they gave it up because they believed in the struggle they wanted to bring about a new South Africa and here they were discarded on the rubbish heap of history to use a Reaganomic term they were discarded, they were forgotten. Yes, we talk about the lost generation of Soweto uprising, the children, who themselves suffered, but there were these, and some of these were from that generation. They don't, didn't ask for anything, but what they should be getting and being shown is dignity and respect and enabling them to have a decent life. And then we have those within the ANC who've used the ANC as an instrument of self-enrichment, of self-gratification, of ignoring the ideals of what that struggle was about to push forward. I'm talking about prior to um, the conference last year, but we, the remnants of there are still there. We're still seeing it. So what is there to see at Lily's Leaf today? And why is it important for South Africans especially to see the sites? Again, I think there are, you know, it's not such a simple answer. I mean, I could just give a very glib answer. They learn history. That is a very fundamental and important aspect. But it, it's beyond that. 
And again, I think to understand it, we need to understand the context in which we find ourselves in. We're living, unfortunately, on the one hand, in an environment where there is um, growing racial tension. And that growing racial tension, to some degree, is stemming out of the fact there is a vacuum. There is a lack of understanding of what our liberation struggle was about. There was a lack of what the objectives of our struggle were about, as personified and articulated by the Freedom Charter. In particular, the preamble, which says, we the people of South Africa to want to declare for South Africa and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. So there's that vacuum. And if you create a vacuum, you have demagogues who suddenly find themselves crawling into that vacuum and manipulating it. So Lily's Lee as a historical site, as a site of memory, is fulfilling a fundamental and important role of ensuring that we do not forget about a very symbolic, significant epoch in our struggle, which, was, which articulated and went to the core of what our struggle was about. Because my chairman says, if you want to understand the meaning of the struggle, Lily's Leaf is your starting point. So that is what we're trying to achieve. So we want to bring visitors so that they start to appreciate and understand the struggle. And I always like to use the example of the 10-year-old snitch story that we have here, because it goes to the root of that struggle. He was a, he was a little boy that lived on the caravan park and he would come and play here with the Goldreich children. And one day he noticed something in his eyes which was highly unusual. White men and black men shaking hands. So you can just imagine unusual and he went home and he said I've just witnessed something unusual white men and black men shaking hand, shaking hands and his parents took him to the local police station and the police said next time you're there write down all the number plates but the important aspect of that simple normal social interaction of shaking hands is so fundamental because it goes to the core of individuals treating each other as equals, respecting each other, and interacting with each other, not predicated by anything other than a common bond. And Lily's Leaf is, is the bastion, is that I like to refer to as the last Alamo, because it is, it is preserving the true identity, the true value of what our liberation struggle was about and what the ANC was about. The battle of ideas, debate, dialogue, engagement, the multiracialism of who met here, the belief, the aspirations, the self-sacrifice, the willingness to give up all creature comforts, to achieve and bring about a new South Africa where all could live together, as Nelson said, in harmony. So, to answer your question, it's multifaceted. Keeping the history alive, a place of education, a place where people can come and learn about our struggle, but as just as important, preserving the true essence and meaning and, and ideals of what our struggle was about. Can you tell us about the funding for Lily's Leaf and what are your plans for the farm in the coming years? That's a very depressing question. The, the Lily's Leaf um, effectively survives on donor funding because we are unfortunately in a situation whereby the Department of Arts and Culture who funds historical sites is reluctant to give us funding because effectively they say they can only give us funding if we become a cultural institution and fall directly under the department. And we don't want to do that for a number of reasons. We want to preserve our independence because we do a lot of interesting things. We do dialogues. We engage with broader civil society, with the political community, with the diplomatic community. And that will be lost if we suddenly are seen to be fall under the, the, the government. That sense of independence, that sense of this is a place where you can come and engage in an environment which is free. Because that's what makes Lily's Leaf also unique. People feel very comfortable to come and engage here. And we don't want to jeopardize that. We want to preserve our independence because we want to be able to continue to push forward with the, uh, the projects that we're doing, like capturing the stories of the role of the international community. There are so many things that we feel would be lost 
our creativity would be stifled, we would become bureaucratic. It would impact upon the efficacy of and what we've established here. And because of that, we are in constant contestation with the department who are be reluctant to give us funding. The department should be there to fund regardless of whether we are we fall directly under their control or are independent. The objective of the, the Department of Arts and Culture should be to assist all sites of memory that aim to preserve our history regardless of that history. Because um, um, Kada Asmal said it's not about suppressing our past, it's about a gathering of all, allowing all of our history to be given expression. Because that is who we are. We are a multiracial society with diverse histories. Within that, there's conflictual, painful history. But we can't suppress it. We have to acknowledge it and give it space. We can't suppress it. So we battle. We also battle because we can't get funding from the private sector here because they're not willing to provide for operational funding. So we uh, battle to s find funding sources. We do have a couple of corporates in South Africa who are willing to fund us and who support and believe firmly in what we're trying to achieve. But we're always living on a, a kind of hand-to-mouth existence. You know, it's not like monthly, but you know, over a period of a year, we don't know what's going to happen after a year. So we're constantly trying to find funds to keep this place going. And it also impacts upon our ability to do exhibits because the opportunities have also been closed off to us. Because interestingly, we're not within the context of the ICT charter and the BE charter, we're not deemed educational. If we're not educational, what are we? Because I say we are the source of education. We are the source from which the educationists extract the knowledge. So it's interesting, we find ourselves in a very unique situation. We've developed a reputation. You just have to go on TripAdvisor. We're described as the best or if not one of the best historical sites in the world. We've built up a reputation and we want to preserve that and we want to build upon that. We want to take it forward. The fact that we are considered to be one of the world's best should be something that the Department of Arts and Culture should be extremely proud of and say that with, and should support us, that we can reach those standards. That was Lily Leaf's Farm CEO, Nicholas Wolpe, here to discuss the farm and the current political climate in South Africa.